Hello and welcome to the New Europe Studio in Place Jourdan. I am Dan Alexe. With us today, Rami Jarrah from Syria. He is a Syrian journalist, very young, he's only 30. Uh, you got the International uh, Free Press Award in 2012 for your coverage of the Syrian conflict. You were not born in Syria proper, but... Uh, no, no, I was born in Cyprus. In Cyprus. And then uh, grew up in, in the UK. Um, I actually first went to Syria in 2004 um, and then spent... So late? Yes, quite late, yes. But you speak the language? I speak... I actually, I actually, in the family, uh, I understood the language, but I started actually speaking when I came to Syria. Yeah. And that's when I learned it. Took and what made you years. a journalist? Uh, apart from the fact that I'd studied journalism, when, when I, and I won't, wasn't able to practice it uh, from 2004 until 2011 because of the restrictions in Syria, so I went into import and export. Um, but when the uprising began, there was a shortage of information that was coming out of Syria. Local and regional media had not yet, well, local never made any decision, but regional media didn't make a decision on covering Syria for the first, I think, two or three weeks. So it was up to citizen journalists to sort of convey, uh, whether through filming or contacting uh, international media and explaining what was going on, it was up to citizen journalists to do that. Um, that's why I took, I took out that role, there, there was a shortage. And, and now you live in Cairo most of the time, um, in Egypt? We were in Cairo until uh, late 2013. And you founded a journalist association in, in, in Egypt? We founded it in Egypt, Anna? yes. Anna. What, what, yes. Does, what does it mean? Uh, Anna is, uh, if it's to translation, it means I, uh, which is a very selfish name, but the, the point pronoun, was... I, right, Anna. yes, precisely, because um, it was a joining of efforts between a lot of individual successes, uh, that they could come together and build one sort of body that, provide, that, that coordinated together because we had a very discoordinated lands media landscape in Syria. It's one of a number of projects. There are a number of projects that, that actually offer this. Uh, but it's now based in Turkey because we had to move uh, because of the crackdown that took place in Egypt in late 2013. We were also, also accused in participating because we covered the events there. So that's the result of the Arab Spring in yes, Egypt. Yes, yes. <laughs> You uh, got praise stay. for your uh, use of social media as well right. in covering the conflict. Right. What social media can function in Syria? Uh, realistically, any social media when you have internet. Uh, the problem is, is a shortage of, in, of internet. So in areas that are um, under rebel control, or it's satellite internet, so it's mainly individuals that have access to satellite internet, and that's not usual. So it's mainly activists, media activists, Italian groups. Don't they block um, sites? And um, they, can't, they don't have the technology? It's, it's, the Syrian regime are not able to block anything over satellite internet. But as I said, that's a very small number of people that are using that, a small percentage. Whether in um, regime controlled areas that are controlled by Assad's forces, they're able to monitor everything. They use advanced systems such as blue coat systems, uh, American systems to monitor people. Um, they can't monitor the full capacity, but if they're targeting someone in particular, they can get information to, to sort of uh, source down on them. So how do you do this uh, coverage? You are based in Turkey, close to the city of Kobani, which is uh, besieged yes. by, uh, by the Islamic army. Where, yes. How do you gather the, the information? Uh, honestly, um, in our exact location is closer to Aleppo, uh, whereas a, a nearby city is close to um, an area called Suruj, uh, Orfa and a small village called Suruj, which is next to Kobani. Um, it's not really very easy to cover the situation from a neighboring country. You have to depend on people that you have inside the country that are more acquainted to those areas. Even myself as a Syrian activist or a journalist, to, to, to make my way into uh, any city like Aleppo, I'm still a stranger. Uh, I'm from Damascus. Inside Syria? Yes, I'm, I'm from Damascus. In Syria, in it's... in Cyprus, you studied in Britain. Right, yeah, and now I'm and in Syria. Who, who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, no, but really, you know, the dialect in, in the Arabic language, especially in Syrian, you can tell the difference where you're from. You have people that have this tribal accent, you have the Damascus accent, the Aleppo accent. What's your accent? Uh, Damascus. Damascus. And that would create some sort of suspicion amongst Syrians in a different area. What's your nationality? Uh, my nationality is Syrian. Syrian. You're, you're Syrian? Yes, yeah. yes. I don't have any other nationality. And are you able to travel <coughs> as freely as you did today? You came to Brussels? Uh, with a lot of help uh, from the, um, uh, Alan Smith, the MEP who helped invite me, and Shems um, who who worked very hard on getting me here, uh, it wasn't very easy. You know, I have to apply, and for Syrians, it's not very easy to get um, visas to come to Europe. 
so it's not very easy. It's, it's, it's a problem, but in order to get a passport, I think I have to go through a, a long process of leaving uh, Turkey and being in Europe. And uh, at the moment, I don't have time to do that. Coming back to journalism, how can a journalist not be biased in such a conflict? And especially if you're an activist as well. <laughs> I, think, I think that activists are more able to be uh, more in-depth when they report. I think that's a positive side. Uh, I think it depends what they do with that knowledge. Yes, of course. It, it's, it's exactly that. They're able to be more de provide more detail, more context, but the problem is, is, is being neutral. And I think neutral is a strong word. I think ob objectiveness okay. is, is what we aim for. Um, during the Syrian uprising, from the very beginning, it was not really very... Uh, it, there wasn't really any pressure to lie, or to, because really there was a situation where there's a crackdown on peaceful protest. When there began to be signs of an armed rebellion, uh, some people were hiding this. Um, and this caused some problems internally, where local communities saw the lying, and some of them would even not be convinced by the revolution, not be convinced by this movement. Uh, I think once you learn that telling the truth in, in a situation, if you're an activist, then you're with something that's righteous. You can't be an activist and su support dictatorship. So activists are on the side that's against the Assad regime. Being totally objective actually offered some value to the situation. I think once there's an acknowledgement by the activist citizen journalists of that, then I think they can do a very good job of providing professional, sustainable journalism. So trying to be objective as you are doing now, what do you do with the fact that Assad slowly seems to shift towards the, the camp of the good? Right. Uh, this is an issue that here at the parliament, um, a lot of questions on should we actually be working alongside Assad in combating uh, the terrorist groups? Um, I think there are strong arguments against that. I think uh, the problem here remains that Assad um, is really the chicken and ISIS is really the egg. Um, these terrorist groups were only able to operate in Syria because Assad allowed them to, because it supported his narrative and it was the propaganda that these groups, these people that were protesting against me are in fact terrorist groups, because that was the accusation before they were even there. Um, in terms of reporting, it's, it's a very big obstacle, because the media focus today is mainly focused on extremist groups. And this makes um, our job much harder because we're not mainstream media, we're local media. We're reporting to a public that actually knows this. Uh, when reporting to an international public, we have to compete with the likes of very large um, entities that have one, one channel, and this is extremist groups. Uh, so it's actually a very big obstacle. And, and one doesn't mm. write very much about uh, the non-confessional resistance. Is there any such thing today? There used uh, to be in the past, but they disappeared from the radar I, of the media. Right. Well, what you have, if, if I could segment this, you have three types of groups in Syria that are fighting. Um, and I'm excluding the regime groups. Yes. The regime yeah. groups, I'm going to consider one. Uh, so this, it would be four. You have one, the very extreme element, which is ISIS. You have the moderate the Islamist... Islamic State, as we call it. Right, yes. Daesh. And you have Daesh. And you have the moderate Islamist groups. I don't want to call them moderates, because I think that's a word that's been made up for no reason. They're moderate Islamist groups. And you have something in the middle, which is Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, I don't think, has a future. Uh, I think that there's, there's no room for it. Uh, a lot of the very extreme fighters have left and joined ISIS, uh, and a lot of the moderate uh, Islamists have left Jabhat al-Nusra and joined uh, these moderate Islamist groups. Why is Jabhat al-Nusra still around? It's because um, you need to protect yourself. To say that you're a free Syrian army fighter, you, you're not safe. Uh, you're, you're, you're enemies of the Syrian regime, and you're enemies with fundamentalist groups which consider you blasphemous. So to say that you're Jabhat al-Nusra, to join Jabhat al-Nusra, you're somewhat safe. Um, if a faction that was moderate was actually supported in Syria, Jabhat al-Nusra would fade away, ISIS would gradually lose support, uh, they, w with coalition attacks and a local partner to fight against ISIS, I think it would be a matter of months that we'd, we'd get rid of, of this nightmare or this cancer that we call ISIS. Do you cover the, uh, f the fate of the refugees as well? Um, we, <laughs> we try to, but it's something that's, that is very much focused on. 
Um, I think there, there isn't much absence of media to focus on refugees because it's not very hard to reach refugees that are in countries like Lebanon or Jordan or uh, Turkey if there aren't any restrictions from, from those governments, uh, especially like what we see in, in Jordan or Lebanon. Turkey is, I think, much easier in that sense. Um, we try to, but I think that there's enough coverage in that sense on, on the refugees. I think the, the, the issues that we don't see coverage of is the situation inside and actually humanizing with, with people inside the country. Did you see uh, biased coverage from the foreign media? From? The foreign media, the international media. Foreign media. media. Um, I, I, I won't call it bias, I'll, I'll call it... Um, can Al Jazeera cover the conflict in the same way as right, the BBC? Right, okay, if we're going to consider foreign media, if we're going to talk about regional media, yes. Uh, Al Jazeera is very biased. A number of Arabic channels have actually caused a conflict in Syria because of their biased reporting and because it's, it's being biased to the sort of political stand that they have. And that's a disaster. And that's, I think, why we established Syrian independent media groups, because we want to compete with this. Uh, because they've not been able only to influence regional publics and international publics, uh, given that Al Jazeera actually also have an English channel that's quite successful. Yeah. Uh, they've also been able to influence Syrian society itself. And, and this is a main issue. Uh, because if, if you look at the statistics of what Syrians are watching inside, they're mainly watching Al, Al Jazeera and Al Arabi and, and, and BBC, of course, which is, I think, much more sensible on, on, on Syria. Uh, maybe, maybe not in Egypt, in, in my opinion. Um, so th there is um, a lot of competition in that sense, uh, in, in terms of regional media. But biased media, I've seen, what I was mentioning is that if you look at even Western media, it's very closed in terms of context, and it's very focused on things like, for example, if it's US media, it's focused on Iraq and anything that's related to Iraq. So once the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant came into the picture, uh, it was very much the focus and it sort of drowned it out, the humanizing and all the other stories that are in Syria. And that's, that's an obstacle. Do you see any end of the conflict without a breakup of the country following confessional and regional lines, like a Kurdish land, an Alawite highland and so right. on? I think just the very fact that you have a lot of uh, withstanding this sort of scenario from even um, you know, the general community, they don't want to see Syria divided up. I think that there is hope that that's not the case. I'm not saying that that's definitely not the case. I think there is hope that it's not. Uh, but I think the original problem that we have in Syria is that Syria was already divided. Uh, and this is something that a lot of people try to avoid talking about. Um, uh, Sykes and Peacock, the original uh, division, it, it has left us in a position where you have someone um, who's in Deir Zor, who doesn't look like someone that's in Damascus, who has no real, real cultural um, uh, common, co commonalities between them, but you look at uh, someone in Damascus and someone in Beirut, in a totally different country, and you find that they, they look very much like it's each like other. It's like the Durand line that separates Precisely. Afghanistan and yes, Pakistan. Yes, exactly. It's totally artificial. Exactly. So, so this is a problem that we already have, and, and I, I wonder, uh, was this always going to be the case? Does Syria really have any borders? Um, look at Turkey and Syria. You, in, in southern Turkey, there are Arabic speakers. Um, look very much like us. We look very much like them. We get along. We have the same food. So, um, you know, I wonder in that sense. But I think what, what was important in Syria was that we did see an uprising like this um, to wake people up in terms of their rights. In, if they end up living in Jordan, or they end up living in Iraq, or they end up living in Lebanon, or, or Turkey, or they get new passports, or, and Syria, then we see some sort of shift to this, and, and maybe these uh, dictatorship regimes lose power. Uh, the point would be that these people have gained that, that self um, to dominate, you know, dominate themselves rather than being dominated by someone else and actually think for themselves. I think that was the aim. It wasn't to create a stronger Syria that would then be able to have a new political agenda. Of course, I, I hope that Syria remains intact, but I want to be realistic. Right. And finally, uh, now you came to Brussels, you had some meetings in the European Parliament, inside the um, Commission's foreign, uh, service, foreign Action Services. Do you feel that the Europeans understand the situation? And uh, if not, how could you pass the message? And what could they do more than they do already? Right. I'm still in their country, so I'm, I could get into trouble if I say anything that I'm doing. <laughs> this is what you would say if you were in a country that, was, um, that had no uh, sort of system for democracy. Um, but I think that there is something disturbing, and it's that generally there is low context, low understanding of the situation. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of the questions seemed a bit very, very simple. It seemed like something that you, you, know, you, would, you would hear from someone that doesn't have much background on what's going on. 
Uh, I think what's worrying is that there are many voices that are coming out from different member states uh, asking on possible collaboration with the Syrian regime. And I think um, if the Syrian context was uns understood properly, they would know that that was a ridiculous, um, a r a ridiculous idea that could um, further lead the country into more destruction and lead the region into more destruction and create, I mean, the worry is, and this is what has pushed people to accept Assad, and push you know, European uh, member states to consider collaborating with Assad is that Islamic extremism is increasing. But there's a missing link here. It's what has caused Islamic extremism? What, what is the essence of the problem in Syria? The essence of the problem is political. It's human rights. If you don't solve this problem from its essence, it's going to remain there. There is something that these Islamic fundamentalists have in common with uh, people that were calling for their rights in 2011 and have since lost their homes, lost their children, um, and you know, generally um, their lives have been devastated. They have something in common with the extremists and it's that they feel that they have no place in the world for different reasons, for total different reasons, but it means that they can end up on the same page. And if that's what the international community is looking for, then they're doing a perfect job. I think what, what is needed is to recognize that you cannot have uh, Syria or Egypt or any of the countries in the Arab Spring to be uh, a role model. You can't have them to look like Europe or to look like they're, they're their own continent, they're their own countries, they have their own lifestyle and there is Islam. And um, I'm not religious myself in any sense, but uh, it's, it's a religion that is based on peace. It sounds very strange, but it is a religion that is based on peace. Um, there's a very big misconception in Arab and, and Muslim societies on, on exactly how that's done. And any, um, the current treatment is just making it worse. I think it's very important to recognize who are the ones we can deal with and who are the ones not. ISIS is off the chart. There are other groups that are, can actually be part of this shifting process in taking down ISIS and pressuring Assad into a real pol political solution and not this frenzy, which I think is, is not getting us anywhere. Yeah, ISIS is the conjurations, conjuration of the, uh, the losers, as you yes, said. Yes, precisely. Yes. Rami Jara, thank you, thank you for being with us. Thank we you had for Rami me. Jara, Syrian journalist and a leading expert in the field of uh, Middle East and uh, the Syrian conflict. I am Dan Alexe. We are in the New Europe studios in Place Jourdan. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.